Hello, it's Craig here. I was going to drop my dual wield staff video, but patch 1.04 just dropped and I have to fix some numbers regarding FP and spells. So the dual wield staff and the pure sorcery build will be coming next, sorry about the delay. We're covering straight swords this time. There are 19 straight swords, so I originally thought it would require two parts, but it turned out one would be enough. I will still make sure you get all the relevant details though, so don't worry. The discussion will be split into two parts. Unique weapons which can be infused by an Ash of War and regular weapons. Since regular weapons have more variety, I will be splitting them into these categories because of the similarities. If you haven't watched my damage calculation video or soft caps guide, they are linked in the description down below and will help you better understand the optimization done in this video. First of all, let's start with the range of the straight swords. Once again, I have to thank Catch for collecting this data. This time, I think range matters far less. If range is a big issue, you should try another weapon type because straight swords have very similar lengths, which is to say, not very long. If you ignore the three shortest sword, Centrina, Weathered, and Short Sword, of which only one is worth considering if you like the unique sleep status it provides, the other sword lengths are less than 8% apart. That is to say, even the Noble Slender Sword barely has any length advantage on most of these other options. With the range out of the way, let's check out straight swords with different movesets. Weapons have varying movesets, so we can't just look at the weapon with the highest attack rating, otherwise known as AR, and call it the strongest weapon of the class, as it would be very misleading. We must consider other parts of their kit, such as their motion values or damage percent. First of all, these are the heavy attacks of regular straight swords. The Warhawk's Talon's first heavy attack hits twice, which performs almost like a double slash weapon art. The follow-up only hits once like a regular heavy attack, but the charged version of the Warhawk's Talon's heavy attack does a double hit for both hit 1 and hit 2. The status damage of the heavy attack is 50% higher than other straight swords because it is split into two hits, but the poise damage is the same as any other heavy attack, assuming you land both hits. Next, while charging up the heavy attack of the Carrion Knight Sword or the Lazuli Glenstone Sword, you do a guard animation. Honestly, this is more of a gimmick because you have poor guard with either straight sword, and you can easily be guard broken if you run out of stamina while blocking. The heavy attack itself isn't stronger either, but it is a neat difference with some niche uses, so I'm still mentioning it. While we're at it, the McKeelan's Night Sword also has a different heavy attack from the two regular heavy attack patterns of other straight swords. I thought it was worth a mention because the uncharged version is fast, while the charged version lets you dash forward a bit. Again, the damage, poise, etc. are all the same, but the animation is different. Finally, we have the Ornamental Straight Sword, and this sword has a lot of different movesets. The Ornamental Straight Sword is a paired weapon so pretty much all parts of its two-handed moveset is unique. An interesting trick is applying the Golden Tempering Weapon Art. This way, your heavy attacks perform the two-handed version even though you're holding something else in your offhand. The sad thing is, the buff is weak, only adding a 5 holy damage. And because the moves are split into so many hits, your damage is actually quite low because defense is applied separately for each hit. It's a sword with a very unique moveset, but it has a relatively low attack, making its overall performance lackluster. The Colded Sword deals pure holy damage. Because the sword has no other strength or dexterity requirement, this sword can reach very high scaling quickly and be used very effectively in even hybrid builds, requiring only 50 faith to reach the faith soft cap. It also means that you can easily get the most out of this weapon, even if you're mainly a caster. Even the second soft cap only requires 70 points of investment. The weapon art, Unblockable Blade, cannot be blocked and greatly extends your range. Since this sword is purely holy damage, even without the weapon art, you are able to tear through shields very easily. The Regalia of Aeoched shares the weapon art with the Mirai's Executioner Sword. The sword itself is nothing special. You would use this sword because of the weapon art, which is recently buffed. You can now roll out of the animation without the swing if you don't catch anyone or see an attack coming. The 1.04 patch definitely made the weapon arts feel smoother to use. The longer you charge the weapon art, Aeoched's Dancing Blade, 
the further the blade travels. If you're running this weapon, I would highly suggest using the talismans that boost successive attacks, because every hit of the weapon art counts as hits towards getting your talisman up. Running both the Rotten Wing Sword Talisman and the Millicent's Prosthesis would be ideal. The Carrion Knight Sword is, in my opinion, very poorly designed. I don't mean the looks, because the sword looks great. I'm talking about the overall design of the weapon, minus the looks. Carrion Grandeur isn't a unique Ash of War, so it doesn't save this sword from its poor design. At all levels of intelligence, this sword will lose to a magic-infused broadsword, which also weighs 4 weight. And no, the Carrion Grandeur on the blade isn't stronger than the Ash of War version. So you might think, oh how about for the 70 point investment, we can try a more physical based build than a magic one. First up, I have no idea why you will want to do that. If you're planning on going for more scaling with strength, yes, it would have more overall attack than going for 80 intelligence. But your Ash of War scales to your magic attack. And neither of these really work because the broadsword with magic infusion still beats both of these instances with the same level of investment, while being able to use the same weapon art or a better one. At max stats, the carrier knight sword has more AR than the magic infused broadsword, but the main reason for you to use a magic weapon is to scale the weapon art better, not to swing it around. Otherwise, why don't you just use cold infused broadsword for frostbite buildup? It would just be better than the carrier knight sword. I also don't think the blocking heavy attack is enough to save this sword. The Lazuli Glintstone Sword suffers from the same exact issue as the Carrier Knight Sword. I call it the Broadsword Test. My first character in Elden Ring was a Spellblade, and I got suggested with many of these videos, so I fixed the thumbnails for them. It turns out that this guy, not far from the tutorial in Limgrave, sells you a better sword for 1800 runes. The Carrion Pebble on the Lazuli is exactly the same as the Ash of War version. The Magic Infused Broadsword beats the Lazuli Glintstone Sword. Similarly, on the Faith side, the McKeelan Knight's Sword also fails the Broadsword test. Like the Intelligence Scaling Swords, the McKeelan Knight's Sword only has D in Faith Scaling at plus 10. Sacred Blade is yet another non-unique Ash of War, and it scales to your holy damage. Once again, the broadsword has a higher attack rating while investing into faith. While the golden epitaph also fails the broadsword test, it does have a unique weapon art, Last Rites. Last Rites does an AoE buff that also applies to your allies. It shares the same slot with the golden vow though, but it gives you 25 holy damage and allows you to permanently kill skeletons. Also, golden epitaph even without a buff permanently kills the annoying skeletons already. Furthermore, this information is not on the wiki. But the Golden Epitaph deals 1.3 times damage to undead enemies. At least you can swap this sword on for certain PvE zones. Other than the Torch, Sword of Centrina is the only weapon with a sleep status buildup in game. I optimize the stat investment for its attack, and it actually isn't that low when you don't chase the soft caps. Its weapon art, Mists of Slumber, is also sleep oriented, so if you're interested in the sleep style gameplay, this one is perfect for you. The Crystal Sword and the Rotten Crystal Sword are nearly identical weapons, so I'll cover them together. They scale pretty much exactly the same, except the Crystal Sword has a tiny bit higher base stats, while the Rotten Crystal Sword has 50 Scarlet Rot buildup. From the data, you can see that just for a bit of AR loss, you will be able to apply Scarlet Rot with every hit. Since their weapon art, Spinning Slash, directly uses the weapon as an attack, your attacks from the weapon art will also be applying Scarlet Rot. Therefore, I suggest using the Rotten Crystal Sword over the Crystal Sword for the most part. If you want to pump more stats for the sword, you will want to pump Intelligence to 50 next. This weapon actually has quite the high AR, even with split scaling, because it does not rely on Intelligence scaling for its weapon art. The Rotten Crystal Sword is actually a fairly good choice if you like using the Straight Sword for its moveset. It easily beats the Broadsword test despite having Scarlet Rot. However, I have to mention ahead of time. I used the Fire Broadsword for this comparison, which is the most similar in my opinion, but Fire and Lightning infusions are not good for the straight swords. I saved the best for the last. Even among the unique swords, the Sword of Night and Flame is quite the eye catcher. This is the only tri-scaling weapon at base in the entire game, and one of my personal favorite weapons by design and theme. By investing into intelligence and faith to 50 points each, you can quickly reach a high attack by utilizing the scaling curve. 
However, do not be tricked by its exceptionally high attack rating. Because it is split into three types of damage, it has to go through all three types of defense when you attack with the sword itself. Refer to my damage calculation video in the description if you want more details. What makes this sword exceptionally good though is its powerful weapon art. Even though the FP cost is quite high, the damage is well worth it. You can choose between two attacks with the Knight and Flame stance. Using the light attack after the stance will result in an Azure Comet-like beam that scales to the intelligence portion of the weapon. Using the heavy attack after taking the stance will result in a wide sweeping flame attack that scales to the faith portion of the weapon. I know most people prefer the intelligence variation of the weapon art, but I think both are very viable choices in their own right. When you don't have enough skill points though, you will tend to focus on only one of the weapon art. You will end up with the same AR, so all it depends is which weapon art you want to be spamming. <sighs> We're finally done with the unique weapons. There are still 8 more regular weapons, but it won't take too long. For the regular weapons, we have our trusty broadsword, the noble slender sword, warhawk's talon, long sword, cane sword, lord sworn's straight sword, weathered straight sword, and short sword. In the following examples, you will not see the cane sword and the weathered straight sword pop out because there are only 6 slots in the weapon AR calculator but I picked the two crappiest weapons to not show. If you want an idea of how bad the weapons are, just look for the short sword. The cane sword and weather straight sword will always have a lower AR than the short sword no matter what infusion you pick. Let's start with the heavy infusion. The three swords that you actually have to keep an eye on are the broadsword, the noble slender sword, and the warhawk's talon. I'm saying keep an eye on the noble slender because I know some people might just want that extra range however small it is. The Warhawk's talent is mentioned because of its unique heavy attack. This is them at 80 strength. Next, we have the Fire Infusion. However, because of the straight sword's low base AR and poor Fire Infusion scaling, I would suggest not to use the Fire Infusion if you have 80 strength, unless you know your target is weaker to fire than physical. If your enemy has about the same fire negation and physical negation, the fire infusion will make you do less damage. Next we have the keen infusion. As you can see, the broadsword miraculously beats a noble slender sword despite the slender sword scaling better to dexterity. At 80 dexterity, it still beats the slender sword, but you would rather use the broadsword on heavy. The slender sword and the warhawks scale better with the keen infusion. Lightning suffers the same issue as fire, although to a slightly lower degree since players tend to have a stronger fire defense. For PvE, it depends on the target's negation, but in general, if the physical and lightning negation are about equal, Keen will outperform lightning at 80 dexterity. As per usual, quality infusion sucks without enough stat points, so it really is more for a high physical scaling at endgame when you have enough points to throw at both strength and dexterity. Something interesting though is the longsword actually beats the broadsword by a bit with quality scaling. This holds true even when strength and dexterity are both at 99. However, you will see later that this is nearly pointless because unless you really want to play quality alongside using buffs from sorceries or incantations, quality infusion isn't that great for straight swords. The flame and sacred options give the exact same amount of attack, so you're only deciding between the two elements. The overall damage is quite similar to the respective straight swords, fire or lightning counterpart. As for the magic infusion, choose this infusion only if you're mainly a mage trying to increase your weapon art damage. Otherwise, the cold infusion would be better if you do use your straight sword mostly for attacks. As discussed in previous videos, poison is typically just a weaker status effect than bleed. Since their scaling is identical, you're just trading the poison status effect for a bleed one. I provided the relevant stat distribution to maximize attack and status effect, but these stats you see are at a higher investment level than the previous infusions like heavy, keen, sacred, etc. You can see the stats aren't particularly stellar even at this investment level. With the 1.04 changes to bleed stagger not being as powerful, you really want to consider whether it's worth running bleed for the sake of losing all that attack. Finally. A cold infusion as per usual is not good for weapons without innate status effects, so you can ignore it for straight swords. Before the summary, let's take a quick look at maxed out stats. 
I've chosen some of the best options to compare. As you see here, when your stats are maxed out, Blood Infusion performs much better with its scaling curve. You give up much less AR in order to get a bleed. Notice here, the quality longsword that has the highest quality scaling is only a tiny bit stronger than the Blood Infused Longsword. And when you compare the Blood Infused Longsword to the Blood Infused Broadsword, the Broadsword wins again. This is why I said the quality longsword is largely irrelevant. You would only run the quality longsword if you're interested in using buffs, which are actually pretty good for raw AR when your stats are maxed. You can check my buff video in the description for more details on buffs. We can take a look at some of the other unique options at maxed out stats. Remember Sonaf needs to go through defense thrice, so its higher AR isn't actually stronger when it comes to raw damage per swing. Alright, let's do a quick summary. If you're a straight sword lover, once you step out of tutorial into first step, grab the Sight of Grace. Collect 1800 runes by exploring. When you have 1800 runes, teleport back to first step Sight of Grace and go left towards the point marked on the map. Find the merchant camping under the ruins. Buy his broadsword for 1800 runes. Congratulations, you now own one of the best and definitely the most versatile straight sword in the entire game. If you like Warhawk's talent's heavy attack, feel free to use that instead. If the range matters to you that much, and you're debating between a heavy broadsword or a keen noble slender, I would actually go for the noble slender. The difference between attack of the two swords when it's heavy broadsword versus keen's noble slender is at its least. So this is the only instance I would recommend the noble slender over the broadsword. Longsword is useful in the niche case when you're at max level and want to use the quality infusion in order to use buffs. As for the unique weapons, Solnaf supports an int faith build really well and has an extremely powerful and unique weapon art. You would also be picking the regalia of Aoched because of the weapon art. The coldest sword can be used very effectively even at low stat investment levels because it doesn't have any other stat requirements and scales purely to faith. It is also good for PvP because it tears through shield users which can be a big issue for many builds. Being this lightweight is easy to equip as a secondary main hand to swap into against shield users. Golden Epitaph is basically a PvE skeleton killer. The Sword of Trina is unique with its sleep status, and the Rotten Crystal Sword has pretty good attack as far as split scaling goes. The regular version is also not out of the question. If you're doing PvP, you most likely won't be inflicting the Scarlet Rot status if the Rotten Crystal Sword is your only source of Scarlet Rot. If that is the case, you're better off with the Crystal Sword with more raw attack. If you want to power stand straight swords on a strength build, using a broadsword plus a crystal sword on the offhand is a great combo to get lots of damage. Like and subscribe. Krite, signing out.